from around the globe. It's the Cube covering Google Cloud next on Air 20. Welcome back. I'm Stu Miniman, and this is the Cube's coverage of Google Cloud Next on Air 20. Of course, the nine-week distributed all online program that Google Cloud is doing, and uh, going to be talking about, of course, multi-cloud. Uh, Google, of course, uh, had a big piece in multi-cloud uh, when when they took what was originally Borg. They built Kubernetes. Uh, they made that open source and gave that to the CNCF. And uh, one of Google's partners and a leader in that space is, of course, Red Hat. Happy to welcome to the program Satish Balakrishnan. He is the Vice President of Hosted Platforms at Red Hat. Satish, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Stuart. It's been great to be here with you on Google uh, Next. All right, so I, I, I teed it up. Of course, you know, we talk about you know, the hybrid multi-cloud and open. You know, uh, the two companies I probably think of the most and that have probably said the most about the, the open cloud are, are Google and, and Red Hat. So maybe if we could start just, uh, you hosted platforms, help us understand what that is and uh, what was the relationship between uh, Red Hat and the OpenShift team and, and Google Cloud? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question, right? You know, I think Google has been an amazing partner for us. I think we have a lot of things going on with them upstream in the community. I think you know, uh, we've been with Google and the Kubernetes project since the beginning, and you know, we are like the second uh, biggest contributor to Kubernetes. So we have great relationship upstream. We've also uh, made Red Hat Enterprise Linux as well as OpenShift available on Google. So we have customers using both our offerings as well as our other offerings on Google Cloud as well. And more recently with uh, hosted offerings, you know, we actually manage OpenShift on multiple clouds. We relaunched our OpenShift dedicated offering on Google Cloud back at Red Hat Summit, you know, and there's a lot of interest for that offering. We had back uh, offered the offering in 2017 with OpenShift 3, and we just relaunched this with OpenShift 4, and we see considerable interest for the Google Cloud with the OpenShift dedicated offering. Yeah, Satish, maybe it makes sense if we talk about the kind of the maturation of open source uh, so solutions. Managed services uh, has seen really tremendous growth, something we've seen especially uh, if we, we're, we're talking about in the cloud space. Maybe if you could just walk us through a little bit about that. You know, what are you hearing from customers? Uh, how, how does Red Hat, uh, you know, think about managed solutions? Yeah, no, absolutely, Stu. I think this is a good question, right? I think uh, as we see that customers are looking at you know multiple infrastructure footprints, be it either the public cloud or on-prem, uh, they do start looking at you know if I go to the cloud, you know there is this concept of I want something to be managed. So uh, what OpenShift is doing is you know OpenShift as you know is Red Hat's uh, hybrid cloud platform, and with OpenShift, one of the things that we strive to do is to enable uh, the vision of the open hybrid cloud. Uh, so with open hybrid cloud, it's all about choice, right? So we want to make sure that customers have both a managed as well as a self-managed option. Uh, so if you really look at it, you know, Red Hat has, you know, multiple offerings uh, from a managed standpoint. One is, you know, we have OpenShift dedicated, which runs on AWS and uh, Google. And, you know, we just have, as I mentioned earlier, we relaunched our Google service at Red Hat Summit uh, back in May. So that's actually getting a lot of traction. We also have, uh, our joint offerings with you know, Azure that we've been announced a couple of years back and you know, there's a lot of interest for that offering as well as the new offering that we announced to post summit, the Amazon Red Hat OpenShift, which basically is another native offering that we have on Amazon. If you really look at, you know, having, having spoken about these offerings, if you really look at you know, Red Hat's evolution as a managed service provider in the public cloud, we've been doing this since 2011. You know, that's kind of surprising to a lot of people, but you know, uh, we've been, uh, doing OpenShift Online, which is kind of a multi-tenant pass or multi-tenant CAS solution since 2011. And we are one of the earliest providers of managed Kubernetes, you know, along with the Google Kubernetes Engine, GKE. We announced our OpenShift dedicated offering back in 2015. So we've been doing Kubernetes managed since, you know, OpenShift 3.1. Uh, so that's actually, you know, we have a lot of experience with the management of Kubernetes and, you know, with the evolution of OpenShift 4, we've now made it available in pretty much all the clouds so that customers have that exact same experience that they can get any in one cloud across all clouds as well as on-prem. And we, with managed services, customers now have a choice of either self-managed OpenShift or a completely managed OpenShift. Yeah, you mentioned the choice, and uh, one of the challenges we have right now is there's really the paradox of choice. Uh, if you look in the Kubernetes space, uh, you know there are dozens of offerings. Of course, every cloud provider has their offerings. You know, Google's got GKE, they have Anthos, 
Uh, they, they have management tools around there. Uh, you, you talked a bit about the, you know, the experience and all of the customers you have. Uh, the, you know, there's one of the providers talks about, you know, there's no compression algorithms for experience. So, you know, what is, what is Red Hat OpenShift, you know, what really differentiates it in the marketplace uh, from, you know, so many of the other offerings, either from uh, the public hire providers, some of the new startups uh, that we should know? And I think this is an interesting question, right? I think all Kubernetes, you know, it starts with it's complete open source. And, you know, we are a complete open source company, so there is no proprietary software that we put into uh, OpenShift. So OpenShift basically, even though it has, you know, OC command, it basically has a cube CTL. So you can actually use native Kubernetes as you would choose on any Kubernetes offering that you have, be it GKE, EKS, AKS, or any of the other Kubernetes offerings that are out there. So that's, I think, the first thing, right? Kubernetes is Kubernetes, and Red Hat does not believe in open core. It completely believes in open source. We have everything that we do is open source. From an, uh, Red Hat standpoint, the value prop for Red Hat has always been the value of the subscription, where we actually make sure that you know Kubernetes is taken from an upstream product. It's basically completely productized and uh, available for uh, the enterprise to consume. With that, right, when we have the managed offering, we provide a lot more benefits to it, right? The benefits are, right, we actually are customer zero for OpenShift. Uh, so what, what does that mean, right? We will not release OpenShift if we can't run OpenShift dedicated or any of the Azure Red Hat OpenShift or the Amazon Red Hat OpenShift really, really well. Uh, so you won't get a software version out there. The second thing is we actually run a lot of workloads within Red Hat that are dependent on our managed OpenShift offering. So for example, our build systems, all of those internal things that are important for Red Hat run on managed OpenShift. For example, Query.io runs on managed OpenShift. So those are important services for Red Hat and we have to make sure that those things are running really, really well. So we provide that second layer of enterprise to it. Right? Then having put OpenShift online out there in public, Right, uh, we have uh, four million applications and a million developers that use them. So that means you know we're putting it out there in the internet, and you know there's security holes that are constantly being poked that are being plugged in. So that's another benefit that you get from you know having a product that's a managed service, but it also is something that enterprises can now use it. From an OpenShift standpoint, the real differentiation is we add a lot of other things on top of Kubernetes without compromising the Kubernetes API that basically helps customers not have to worry about how they're going to get a CI CD pipeline or how they have to uh, do a build uh, in, in, in Kubernetes. Is it outside or is it inside? Then you have technologies like source to image, which kind of really help customers abstract away the containerization layer from them. So those are some of the benefits that we provide with OpenShift. Yeah, so, so Satish, as you said, there's lots of options uh, when it comes to Kubernetes. Uh, even from a Red Hat offering, uh, you've got different consumption models there. Uh, if I look inside your portfolio, uh, if it's you know something that I want to put on my infrastructure, if I, if I have it right, the OpenShift container platform, is that significantly different from the managed platform? Maybe you know, give us a little compare contrast as to you know, what do I have to do as a customer? Is the code base the same? Uh, can I do you know hybrid uh, environments between them, and uh, you know what what does that mean? A very smart question, Stu. Really, really good question that you asked. Uh, so we actually, you know, uh, as I said, add a lot of things on top of Kubernetes to make it really uh, pass. But you want to use the CAS, you can use that as well. So one of the things we've found with you know uh, what we've done with our managed offering is we actually take OpenShift Container Platform and we manage that. So we make sure that you get like a completely managed service, even though we manage the patching of the worker nodes and other things, which is again another difference that we have with the native Kubernetes services. We actually give cluster admin functionality to customers. That basically allows them to choose all the options that they need uh, from an OpenShift container platform. So from a code base, it's exactly the same thing. The only thing is it's a little bit opinionated to start off when we deploy the cluster for the customer. And then the customer, if they want, they can choose how to customize it. So what this really does is it takes away any of the challenges the customer may have with like how to install or provision a cluster, which we've already simplified a lot with OpenShift 4, but with the managed OpenShift, it's actually just a click away. Great, well, Satish, I've got the trillion dollar question for you. One of the things we've been looking at for years, of course, is you know, what do I keep in my data center? What do I move to the cloud? How do I modernize it? We understand it's a complex and nuanced solution, 
but you talk to a lot of customers. So, I, you know, here in 2020, what's the trends? You know, what, what, what are some of the pieces that you're seeing some, some change in movement that, that, you know, might not have been the case a year ago? I think, you know, this is an interesting question and it's an evolving question, right? And it's something that if you ask like 10 people, you'll get 12 answers. But I'll try to generalize, you know, what uh, I've seen just from all the customer conversations I've been involved in. Uh, I think one thing is very clear, right? I think the world is hybrid, right? As much as, you know, uh, anybody may want to say that I'm going to go to a single cloud or I'm going to just be on-prem. It is inevitable that you're going to basically end up with multiple infrastructure footprints. It's either multi-cloud or it's on-prem versus a single cloud or on-prem versus multiple cloud. Uh, so the main things that, you know, uh, we've been noticing is, you know, what customers are saying, you know, how do I make sure that my developers are not confused by all these different environments? How do I give them a consistent way to develop and build their applications? Not really worry about what is the infrastructure or what is the footprint that they're actually servicing. Right. So that's kind of really, really important. And in terms of, you know, things that, you know, we've seen customers, you know, I think you always start with compliance requirements and data regulation, right? You've got to figure out what compliance do I need and is the infrastructure or the platform that I'm going to go to meet the compliance requirements that I have. Then what are the data regulations? You know, where is the data going to be sitting? Is it going to meet the data sovereignty rules that my country or my geo has? I got to make sure. Uh, I worry about that. And then I got to figure out, you know, if I'm going to basically move it to the cloud from the data center or move it from uh, one cloud to another cloud, am I just doing a lift or shift? Am I doing a transformation? What is it that I got to really worry about? And then in addition to transformation, they got to figure out, is it containerization? Do I need to do that? Do I not need to do that? And then, you know, we got to figure out what's your, what is your data going to sit? What's your database going to look in? And do you need to connect to some legacy system that you have on-prem? And how do you go? How do you have to figure that out? And given all of these complexities, right, this is really, really common for any large enterprise that has like an enterprise IT footprint. That's multi -cloud, That's basically in multiple geographies or is really servicing millions of customers. So Red Hat has a lot of experience doing all these things, right? We have open innovation labs, which is a really, really awesome experience for customers where they take a small project, they figure out how to change things, not only learn, how to change things from a technology standpoint, but also learn things, how to culturally change things. Because a lot of these things, it's not just moving from one infrastructure to another, but also learning how to do things differently. Then we have things like the container adoption program, which is like, how do you take a big legacy monolith application? How do you containerize it? How do you make it microservices? How do you make sure that, you know, you are leveraging the real benefits that you're going to get out of moving to the uh, cloud or moving to a container platform? And then we have a bunch of other things like, you know, how do you get started with OpenShift and all of this? So we've had a lot of experience with like our 2,400 plus customers doing these kind of really heavy workload of migration and lifting so that customers really get the benefits that they see out of OpenShift. Yeah, so, so Satish, if, if I think about Google specifically, you're talking about Google Cloud, one of the main reasons we hear customers using Google is to have access to the data services they have, the AI services they have, so how does that tie into what we were just talking about? If I, if I use OpenShift and you know, I'm, I'm living in Google Cloud, can, can I access all of those cloud native services? Are, are there any nuances or things I need to think about to be able to really unleash that innovation of the platform uh, that, that I'm tying into? Yeah, absolutely not, right? I think it's a great question. And I think customers are always wondering about it. Hey, if I use OpenShift, am I going to be locked out of using the cloud services? And if anything, Red Hat is anti-lock, right? We want to make sure that you can use the best services that you need for your enterprise IT strategy as well as for your applications. So with that, right, and we've developed the operator framework, which I think Google has been a very early supporter of. They've built a lot of operators around their services, so you can leverage those, those operators to manage the life cycle of these services right from OpenShift. So you can actually connect to an AI ML service if you want. That's absolutely fine. You can connect to the database services as well, and you can leverage all of those things while your application runs on OpenShift on Google Cloud. Also, I think what Red Hat has done is, right, we recognize that, you know, when you talk about the open hybrid cloud, you got to make sure that customers can actually leverage services that are the same across different clouds. So while you can actually leverage the Google services from on-prem as well, if you choose to have localized services, we have a large catalog of uh, operators that we have in our operator hub as well as in the Red Hat marketplace that you can actually go and leverage from third-party third party ISVs so that you're, you're basically having the same consistent experience if you choose to uh, build based on that 
consistent experience that's not tied to a cloud, you can do that as well. But we would like for customers to use any service that they want uh, right from OpenShift without any restrictions. Yeah, one of the other things we, we've heard a lot from Google over the last year or so has been, you know, just helping customers, especially for the, those mission critical, you know, business critical applications, uh, things like SAP. You, you talked a bit about databases. What, what advice do you give customers these days uh, if, if they, they're looking at, uh, you know, increasing or moving forward in their, their, their cloud journeys? I think you know it's an interesting uh, question because I think customers really have to look at you know what is their IT and you know technology strategy. What are the different initiatives they have? Is it digital transformation? Is it cloud native development? Is it just containerization, or you know, or they have an overarching theme about cost savings? They got to really figure that out. And I'm sure you know as they look at it, they know which one is the higher priority. And all of them are interrelated in in some ways. Right? Uh, they also got to figure out are they going to expand to new business what, because I think as we said right IT uh, is basically what is driving business software is eating the world you know uh, software services are eating the uh, world so you got to figure out what are, what are your business needs do you need to be more agile do you need to enter new businesses you know those are kind of important things for example you know BMW is a great example they use you know OpenShift container platform as well as they use OpenShift dedicated. You know, uh, they are like, you know, 100, 100 plus year old car, uh, guess, you know, what they're trying to do now, right? They're actually now becoming a connected car infrastructure. And that's the main thing that they're trying to build so that they can actually service their cars in any geography, right? So from in one swoop, right, they became from a car manufacturing company to now focus on being a SaaS and edge and IoT company, if you really look at the cars as like an you know, internet of things on an edge um, computer, really. And what, what, what does that use case require? That use case cannot anymore have just one data center in Munich, right? They have to basically build a global platform of you know, data centers or they can very easily go to the cloud. And then they need to make sure that their application developers, when they're starting to run on multiple clouds, multiple geographies, they have the same abstraction layer so that they can actually deploy things fast, develop things fast. They don't have to worry about the infrastructure footprint. And that's basically you know why they started using OpenShift, and you know why they're big supporters of OpenShift, and you know I think it's the right vision uh, for that use case. So I think it really depends on you know what the customer is looking for, but irrespective of what they're looking for, I think you know OpenShift nicely fits in because what it does is it provides you that commonality across all infrastructure footprints. It gives you all the productivity gains, it, and it allows you to connect to any service that you want anywhere. Uh, because we are agnostic to that, and as well as we bring a whole lot of services from the Red Hat marketplace, so you can actually leverage the test. Well, Satish Balakrishnan, thank you so much for the update. Great to hear about the progress you've got with your customers, and thank you for joining us on the Google Cloud Next On Air event. Thank you, sure. It's been great talking to you, and you know, look forward to seeing you in person one day soon. All right. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you, as always, for watching theCUBE.